Okay. Hello, and welcome everyone to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Matt Graybaugh. I'm the science coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, today I'll be presenting on indicator development for the Eastern Mojave Landscape Conservation Design, which I'll throw at the acronym right now of LCD for Landscape Conservation Design. I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the effort, especially for any new participants, uh, before we get into detail on the indicator process. I'll also provide an orientation to the online forum we'll be using for submission and review of indicators for the Eastern Mojave LCD. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, I want to start by saying that I'm giving this presentation really on behalf of the Eastern Mojave Landscape Conservation Design Coordinating Team. And there's a list of participants in the coordinating team on the screen right now. Um, the Desert LCC team are Genevieve Johnson from the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, myself, Matt Graybaugh, and Colleen Whitaker from Southwest Decision Resources is the project lead um, for the actual cooperative agreement. And then below that, we have a list of several active partners that are participating on this coordinating team. And I think I'll talk about this a little bit more as we get in, uh, but representing a wide variety of agencies as well as local governments um, in the Eastern Mojave region. So this is going to be new, um, a repeat for some of you guys that have been actively involved with the landscape conservation design process in the past, so bear with me and we'll get through it. Um, but hopefully just to provide a quick recap uh, for any new folks here. So the landscape conservation cooperatives across the country are uh, leading landscape conservation design um, efforts. And landscape conservation design is a process to identify develop and strengthen large-scale collaborative relationships to achieve conservation objectives on the landscape scale. Um, so some of the steps on that we'll run through here quickly. Um, the idea is that we convene partners to determine priorities and together those partners identify common resource and social values for the landscape conservation design area. And together, those groups come up with specific goals and objectives for the landscape conservation design in their area. The idea for landscape conservation design is to produce information and tools needed by uh, common, common needs across partners in a geography. So the idea is that we build on existing work and use plans that are already existing out there um, so we're not reinventing the wheel as we get started. Uh, we use a process to assess uh, current conditions of the landscape conservation design area and then integrate scenario planning, which is really to look at possible future conditions for the landscape conservation design area. And these can include things like climate, of course, but also other factors um, like urban development as an example. And I know there's a little bit of a lag in the, the screens popping up due to my internet connection, so I'll try to I'll try to be patient as I start talking on new slides. So landscape conservation designs rely on, on the partners, the group of people at the table to implement actions that they can to collectively achieve um, conservation goals across agencies. So to do that, we identify the suite of adaptation strategies that can be implemented. A big part of the actual landscape conservation design is to figure out where those actions can be put on the ground to best meet um, the goals of the landscape conservation design. And then finally, due to the indicator and assessment framework, uh, there's an adaptive management process that is fairly easy to build in uh, for monitoring and revision of the, um, of the process and sp specifically the conservation actions on the ground. Broadly, for the, the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, um, these are the, our landscape conservation design goals. Uh, specific, uh, to clearly define common goals and objectives of partners within the region. To map priority ecosystems and assess their current condition. To collectively identify adaptation and conservation actions. And then working with partners, we integrate scenario planning to uh, help us prioritize where to put conservation actions on the ground. And then, of course, um, we make sure that partner activities are integrated into the effort and hopefully develop 
a, a method to measure success using common language and methods, and that's part of where the indicator process comes in. On the right side of the presentation here, you see a map of the overall Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative geography. And within that, you see three highlighted areas that are our three landscape conservation design major projects right now. The Dos Rios Landscape Conservation Design, which is the Big Bend portion of the Rio Grande, as well as the lower Rio Conchos in Mexico. The Madrean Watersheds, which is the Sky Island region of southeastern Arizona, portions of New Mexico and down into Mexico. And then finally, the one that we'll be talking about mostly today is the Eastern Mojave Desert Landscape Conservation Design Area. Um, without going all the way down into the history here, I wanted to provide a quick uh, background on how we selected the landscape conservation design pilot areas or the three project areas. It started with some introductory um, LCD workshops in a couple different places back in 2015. And then uh, the LCC initiated a partner assessment across the geography. And we recruited 12 pilot area nominations. So these, this is where there were partnership groups out there that wanted uh, help in developing a landscape conservation design um, in their region. And finally, from those 12 nominated areas, we selected three pilot areas, which are the three areas on the map that I presented on the previous slide. Through this process, we've identified five overarching goals of the landscape conservation designs, and this is common across the three pilot areas. And the really broad categories are here, biodiversity, connectivity, ecosystem integrity, socioeconomic resources, and cultural resources. And an important part of this piece is that while these are the main goals, the actual objectives for those different goals are up to the, uh, the teams for each geography. So now I'll dive in a little bit more to the Eastern Mojave landscape conservation design uh, specifically. Um, again, it's one of three um, LCD areas that we're working on right now. Um, as you all know, it's a large geography. Um, so even though it's a subset of the Desert LCC, it's still a large geography with multiple stakeholders, um, but several folks that are interested in the collaborative conservation effort. The geography is specifically the Eastern Mojave Recovery Unit for the Desert Tortoise uh, from the Desert Tortoise Recovery Plan, plus the overlapping Amargosa River watershed because it hosts a variety of uh, species that are unique to the area and it's a unique water resource in the area. So key progress to date for the Eastern Mojave LCD. Um, one of the big things is establishing the very diverse coordinating team that I presented on the second slide uh, with diverse representation, obviously. We've worked with the coordinating team to get um, input from key partners on goals, objectives, and uh, focal resources or uh, common uh, conservation values within the Eastern Mojave LCD area. We've hosted a variety of outreach webinars, which you can find on the Desert LCC website. Um, coordinating team staff have given presentations at the Desert Tortoise Management Oversight Group. And through these efforts, we've developed a draft vision statement um, for the Eastern Mojave LCD. Uh, we've compiled a long list of potential indicators that we'll talk about um, in the, later in this talk and then started to uh, conceptualize what the analysis process and decision-making framework will be for those indicators. Recently, we've also expanded the project team to get key support uh, for various things. The first is we were able to um, get a project in place with the University of Arizona to help us out specifically with spatial analysis of indicators as well as prioritization down the road. Uh, the Southwest Climate Science Center through the, at the University of Arizona is also, or excuse me, with USGS hosted at the University of Arizona is helping us with the scenario planning effort. And then we've also got um, a project going on um, adaptation strategies and case studies of adaptation strategies throughout our geography, and I'll touch on that more a little bit later in this talk. So some of the very early um, input that we got from partners in the Eastern Mojave uh, were key resources such as groundwater, wildlife linkages, 
and invasive species. Um, so things that I think are not really a surprise, um, but common needs that were identified. Um, part of one of the main things that we've also talked about is really the need for help with land use plan implementation and specifically across state lines. Um, another thing that's common in the Eastern Mojave LCD as well as the other LCDs is figuring out how, um, how to develop site-specific management plans, um, scaling these big picture things down to a local level. Um, finally, linking priorities between land use, land use plans uh, to identify areas of consistency and synergy, which is what a lot of the LCD process is about. And finally, no surprise here, funding is limited, especially for people trying to achieve these actions on their own. So now a couple slides on the Eastern Mojave LCD goals. Um, up at the top is the overall goal um, to promote effective collaboration by leveraging resources to achieve lasting conservation outcomes in the Eastern Mojave Desert, which I know is very high level. Um, there's some more uh, information down below about how we might, um, how we might do these things, um, but really identifying um, and prioritizing areas where partners can work collectively uh, to achieve conservation um, conservation objectives between um, organizations. There are a bunch of additional key objectives on uh, on this slide, which I'm not going to read through read through everything, um, but really tied to a lot of the you know the challenges from the early partner input, um, especially talking about increasing funding leverages, ways for interagency and public-private cooperation. Um, one of the things that's also been really highlighted uh, by several partners is development of a geospatial decision support tool to really inform management um, from the higher level down to the lower site-specific level. And then, of course, various things for um, an ongoing collaborative process, including things like data information sharing, uh, you know, shared leadership, and also development and uh, leverage of uh, funding opportunities. So that kind of, bring, kind of brings us up to speed with where we're at right now. So what's ahead uh, for 2018 and uh, 2019 down here at the bottom? So where we are right now is really in the midst of developing these landscape scale indicators and assessing their current conditions. Um, through a, you know, an integrated effort, uh, the Desert LCC is developing an online management toolbox, which we'll have a webinar on in just a few weeks, and I'll touch on that in a few minutes. But really, it's to develop our list of, or possible adaptation strategies to address stressors and vulnerabilities across the, the landscape conservation design areas, and then also populate those strategies with case studies, um, so examples of where people have done that work on the ground and lessons learned from that. Um, through this process, we'll also you know, initiate the development of this um, prioritization tool for conservation and management actions. So that's on the table for this year during 2018 as, as well. Um, so really, our hope is that by the end of 2018, we'll have the spatially explicit tool as a first, as a first cut uh, for the Eastern Mojave LCD. Uh, the key thing for the following year of uh, 2019 is to revise the landscape conservation design to include um, more information about socioeconomic priorities and potentially socioeconomic indicators. Um, and that information would be to develop a version 2.0, if you will, of the landscape conservation design. Um, you'll note the asterisk down here um, in 2019. Um, like anything else, uh, the 2019 activities are subject to um, appropriation of funding, which we're not sure of yet. So that's the um, big picture on the landscape conservation design process. So the rest of this talk will be uh, mostly on indicators. Um, so the first is, you know, why do we need indicators? And really, uh, for us, it's for spatial analysis um, that informs the condition or that helps us assess condition of the area, but also for the landscape conservation design to determine where we can take appropriate conservation actions. Um, so it's a very simple example. Um, this is obviously, um, you know, just a placeholder in here, but, you know, through the indicator process, we can say, okay, this area is in good condition, um, so it'd be an area that we could prioritize for conservation. Something in poor condition could be prioritized for restoration um, unless um, something from the scenario planning tells us that area is not going to be um, resilient in the future, then we would prioritize work elsewhere. 
the syndicator process and especially the ongoing assessment would also be um, able to provide us a framework for adaptive management. So as actions are taken on the ground, if the indicator process can be rerun, we can see how we're progressing toward meeting those um, conservation goals. So I'm, I'm going to refer to a couple examples in the next couple slides from the South Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And specifically, this is the state of the South Atlantic document um, that I'm referring to here. I know this is a little bit small on your screen, but I'll, um, we'll talk, about, talk through it a little bit. Um, for the South Atlantic, um, the state of the South Atlantic report, they looked at different ecosystems. Um, and in case you can't read those, some examples are upland hardwood, pine and prairie, forested wetland, et cetera. Uh, so different ecosystems within their landscape conservation design area. And then they selected indicators for condition of those different um, ecosystems. So as an example for upland hardwood, um, upland hardwood birds is the first um, indicator. And it's an index of habitat suitability for a suite of hardwood bird species. And then the second indicator for upland hardwood is uh, ur urban open space. So something, you, something that the South Atlantic did with these indicators is to determine the, the amount of the um, ecosystem in different condition levels. And they, in this case, they assigned letter grades to each of the ecosystems. So if something is an A, that means that most of it is in good condition. If something is an F, that means that less than 20% of it is considered to be in good condition based on the indicator process. And the, state of the South Atlantic, uh, again, releases the State of the South Atlantic report, which summarize, summarizes the scores of the indicators across the different ecosystems. Um, and that's on the right. I'm not going to go into much detail on that. So in any case, this is the assessment of current condition of the ecosystems for their landscape conservation design. Um, this next slide shows the landscape conservation design piece for the South Atlantic, which they call the South Atlantic Blueprint. Um, and this is an interactive um, online platform where you can look at different watersheds. You can hover over different watersheds in the LCD area. And it will give you a summary of what the condition is within that watershed, and then gives you um, if you click on the different tabs, which I know you can't see here, um, you can click on the indicators to see the different values for indicators. You can click on land cover to see the portion of that watershed um, that is a specific habitat type and things like that. Uh, but in this case, um, it prioritizes areas for conservation. So that's what this pie chart is in the bottom left, is there is um, the areas that were prior, highest priority for conservation are the areas that are in the best condition. The areas that are not priority for conservation are in not as good condition. So we've had this discussion also with the Eastern Mojave LCD team about why indicators are important. And here's some additional um, bullets that have been pulled up. Um, really, it's a way for partners to rally around common objectives. So if we collectively come up with an indicator that makes sense, uh, then it's something that we agree on, something that we can work together toward. Um, and then finally, the you know, part of the monitoring and adaptive management piece is with indicator framework, we can determine how individual projects at a local scale add up and contribute to landscape scale conservation goals. And we've conceptualized what that framework would look like for the uh, different LCDs in the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative um, geography. Um, and this is, again, based on the South Atlantic framework, where we have, um, in this case, if you focus on the ecosystem integrity goal, goal one up on the top left, you have ecosystem one, which is whatever it is. And the um, South Atlantic example, this was the hardwood, hardwood forest. And then for each of those ecosystems, there's an indicator below that for that ecosystem. We've also talked about using this framework for um, assessing the other goals. Um, again, connectivity down to cultural resources and socio socioeconomic services. Um, some of these are still more in the conceptual phase. Um, so what we're really focused on, right, I'll go ahead and talk about that in the next slide. So this is an, an example um, application of that framework 
um, again, just as a, a straw man. Um, so in this example, for uh, ecosystem integrity, we have integrity of riparian areas. So uh, riparian areas instead of um, hardwood forests like it was for the South Atlantic. And then under riparian areas, we have uh, different indicators. So in, I put in here a placeholder of, um, for example, area of cottonwood willow, um, just as a vegetation cover. And then riparian corridor greenness as an index of you know, how healthy that ecosystem is. So uh, greenness during the dry season would be an indicator, for example, of the availability of shallow groundwater, as an example. Um, there's some other, again, placeholders in here for the different goals, um, connectivity, biodiversity. Um, and so one example is for um, biodiversity goal, we can have indicators for biodiversity hotspots. Um, so uh, I want to try not to get into that too much, though, because really where we're trying to focus on right now are indicators for ecosystem integrity. So indicators across different ecosystems in the Eastern Mojave landscape conservation design. So um, this is um, an overview of the indicator selection process for the Eastern Mojave um, that I'll dive into a little bit. Uh, the first step is to develop a process for selecting indicators, which uh, the Desert LCC has done at this point, um, and a lot of it is outlined in the other uh, pieces of this flowchart. Um, but we um, sent out a call for existing information, which um, are things like resource management plans from all three of our landscape conservation design areas. And those have been compiled to develop a list of potential indicators for the different ecosystems. As we go forward, um, the idea is to identify missing indicators um, that are not on the list yet and use those to draft indicators for um, the Eastern Mojave landscape conservation design. Um, so this is where we're really focused right now in these first five boxes. Um, once we have the draft indicators, there will be a process for revision of those, review and revision, um, and um, process to go forward from that. Um, there's also reference in this flowchart to the selection of targets, which is down the road, but that would be um, things like the, Eastern, uh, like the South Atlantic had for uh, determining targets for a condition of the different ecosystems. The goal for indicator selection for us is to develop a maximum of eight indicators per ecosystem or the other goals um, that we laid out. Uh, but really, ideally, we get down to three to five indicators for each ecosystem. So again, this is our progress to date. We've um, compiled existing information that we'll talk about a little bit going forward. And really where we're at right now and where we're going in the next few weeks is help, we're asking for help in identifying missing indicators. Um, that's where this uh, interactive session at the end of this webinar will go. And um, we'll use those, you'll add those to the pool of indicators for consideration. Then the process will move to narrowing down the list of indicators to those that make the most sense and will be the most effective for the goals of the LCD. Um, so there's a suite of ecological criteria as well as some others in the following slides. And um, these were shared to you all as PDFs, uh, so hopefully you have those for reference if you would like them. Um, I'm not going to walk through all of them, but really the ecological goal here is that they represent key ecological attributes and habitat conditions for different key species and focal resources across the landscape conservation design area. One of the other um, big things I want to uh, emphasize here is that we really want indicators that detect changes over time that occur in response to management actions. So if there are things that, you know, potential indicators that have really large natural fluctuations where that noise would, you know, emit any detection of changes that actually mean something to us, we don't want those indicators. The sec second set of selection criteria are practical criteria. Um, so we're prioritizing indicators that are already being measured um, so that we don't have to go out and uh, try to get additional um, data. Or if there's, you know, if the underlying data are available but just need some technique to roll those data up to be a meaningful indicator, we can consider those. 
Preferably, we'd like to have historic data sets so we can also look for changes over time. Um, and then the final thing to mention here is, you know, can be incorporated into spatial analysis. Again, one of the key things for this is we're hoping to um, be able to assess ecological condition across the landscape, but also be able to use the indicators to hone in on specific areas for conservation. So if we have point measurements um, across the geography that you know, don't reflect a broader condition, those might not be appropriate. Or maybe there's a, a monitoring team that's doing work um, for in a very small portion that doesn't tell you about the larger landscape. Those would not necessarily be helpful. Um, but if there was, you know, if there was point data available that's distributed across the geography that would get at this, we're still open to that. Um, and then as well as anything, uh, for example, like remote sense indicators that could be integrated across the entire geography, um, those types of things will be prioritized. Um, hopefully that's not too unclear. Um, I'm sure I'll have questions about that as we go forward. Uh, finally, the last suite are um, social and cultural criteria. And really, um, the key thing with this is that we want indicators that will make sense even outside a group of scientists. So things that rally not only the scientific teams that are doing this, but also you know, public, private resource managers, uh, hopefully things that link to economic values as well as human health and well-being. So um, this next slide is just a screenshot of how we've been cataloging the potential indicators that we've gotten. Um, so various folks on our team have really dove into uh, again, these resource management plans and looked for anything that's potentially an indicator. Um, so in this, um, in this sh uh, Google Sheet, uh, there's a list of monitoring plans and other plans down the left-hand side with links to, for us to refer to them um, in our account. Uh, we've gone through those to look for areas of relevance and then also pulled out any indicators, uh, any potential indicators that could be pulled out. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. And then from those plans, we've, we're working on coming up with a long list of indicators. Um, this is an, um, an example. This is an old screenshot of potential indicators for the playa ecosystems. Um, so um, indicators over on the left, we've done some categor categorization exercises, in this case to look at extent, stressor, ecological condition, category indicators. Um, and then for our tracking, we also look at, we've got, um, stored, linked, we know where those um, indicators were pulled from. Um, so as you see, the long list of indicators we have together so far, all of those have come from these plans or from other discussions with um, key partners. So the, the coordinating team for the LCD can also contribute indicators um, and some other expert opinion um, is included in there as well. And as I think I already said at this point now, um, the indicators that have come from those plans are used for this draft uh, long list of indicators. So where we're at in the process right now, uh, we've checked our box for existing information. Um, I'm sure there are additional plans that we missed or new things that are still being developed in real time, but at this point, uh, we're closing out that piece and we're moving on um, with things like this interactive webinar session with you guys. And we'll also be hosting some, some workshops that are referenced down below. So uh, right now, this interactive webinar session is to gather more indicators. That's really the focus for this. Um, the University of Arizona staff, the Remote Sensing Laboratory, are helping us assess um, if it's feasible to use contributed indicators as um, spatial, uh, to use um, indicators that are submitted into this um, LCD process. We've also got an indicator workshop coming up on February 26th in Las Vegas. And the idea for this uh, workshop is to prioritize indicators. So once we get this long list, it's time to hone in on the indicators that actually make sense for our ecosystems. Um, and we'll also do some scoring and ranking based on the, the criteria that we talked about here. Um, we expect this is going to be an intensive work session. Um, all day long, we're really going to get into the weeds on the different indicators. Um, so with that caveat, if you really like spatial analysis and indicators and want to, to dive in, uh, please contact us and let us know. 
Um, then once we have that workshop, the team, uh, the project team will process that feedback and then we we'll really will be preparing and gearing up for an April workshop, um, overall landscape conservation design workshop in Las Vegas. So if you'd like to stay informed on the general um, Eastern Mojave LCD, uh, there are various email lists that we have set up through the desertlcc.org website. Um, there's a stakeholder forum, there's a stay informed email list that you can get on if you're not already. A lot of you are already on that list um, and that's how you receive this, um, this webinar invite. Um, the next thing is we'll be hosting a webinar on our adaptation strategies and case studies work. Uh, that webinar is coming up on February 21st. Um, those of you that are on the email list should, will get that webinar invite. It has not gone out yet. Um, but if you're not on the list and you want information on this, let me know. Um, again, the Eastern Mojave Indicator Workshop on February 26th. And then finally, the large uh, Landscape Conservation Design Workshop for the Eastern Mojave is going to be in April 10th and 11th. So at this point, I'm going to wrap up the section, uh, section on general information on the landscape conservation design and um, on indicators. But before we dive into uh, the meeting sphere session, which is where we'll contribute indicators, I want to open up the floor right now to questions or comments on this LCD. Um, again, if you have questions, please enter those in the chat box and video. Um, and I will answer those questions here. And so far it looks like everything I said is perfectly clear because we have no questions, uh, but we'll give it a, another minute or two. Okay. Hearing no questions, what I think I will do next is um, provide an intro to the meeting sphere session here. So give me a second to get there. All right, and uh, if you have questions that do come up during this, please feel free to still enter those in the chat box and video and we'll, we'll circle back to those. Okay, so what uh, we've held aside the rest of this time for, um, and really right on time here, we have almost an hour where we'll be um, hosting this inter uh, interactive session. Um, again, what we're hoping to do with this is expand the list of indicators for um, the different ecosystems that we have listed for the Eastern Mojave. Um, if you have the reference materials um, in hand, I think that will help. Um, you know, on the meeting sphere session, you will be able to see all of the existing indicators, um, but we didn't put the indicator criteria on there because it would have um, made it too large and it's not necessarily that helpful anyway. Um, again, the primary, primary purpose of this is to expand the list. You'll also have the chance to um, prioritize or help us throw out some indicators that are in there right now. Um, and with that, unless we have any questions, which I'm going to check right now, if I can find it, there we go. Okay, so um, one question we do have is if, well, we will be recording the webinar, and again, that, uh, that will be hosted on the desertlcc.org website, and we'll send out a follow-up email that has that information when it's up there. Uh, we'll also make this PowerPoint file available, or at least the PDF. If anybody would like to, so we'll put the PDF online as well, but if you'd like to use PowerPoint slides, um, please just contact uh, one of us directly and we'll share those with you. Um, the other comment in here is that um, some people are having trouble finding the chat box perhaps. So again, if you um, are on your video screen, if you hover on the bottom, there will be a toolbar that pops up. 
uh, with several icons. And the second one from the left will be this um, group chat, uh, which is two bubbles hovering over each other. If you click on that, you should be able to see the group chat. Okay, so there is another question that I that I missed. Um, so there has the question is, has there been a discussion about choosing indicators that we can evaluate using data we're already collecting, such as AIM, which I don't know, LIDAR, et cetera? And the answer to that is, you know, definitely yes. Um, you know, that just indicators we have. Yes, so those are in the loop. So um, the idea with these, and you'll see the list of indicators, any several of the indicators are in there and will need a way to assess those, and it will rely on this type of information. Um, so, uh, so far, primarily through the University of Arizona t uh, Remote Sensing Lab, they're looking at different tools that are available to assess the different indicators. Um, another piece, and we'll talk about this in the meeting sphere session as well, is if folks on this call or not on this call have data that they feel would be useful for this, please let us know. Um, any of that information that's out there, we want to be able to integrate. Again, especially things that uh, where data are already available, and I should have also said, you know, data that will be hopefully repeatedly available in the future. Um, and the, you know, again, part of that is so that we have a framework to, uh, for adaptive management so we can reassess the indicators over time. Okay, and we had a comment also from the University of Arizona, which, uh, Wem, thank you very much. Um, it specified that AIM is BLM's natural resources resource monitoring effort. Uh, so that is on our radar, especially the team's effort, even if it didn't pop into my head, but yeah, it's there. Okay. Any other general questions before we jump into the meeting sphere orientation. Um, and again, thank you everybody that's attended so far. Um, this next uh, session will be to talk about contributing indicators, um, and so we'll dive into that a little bit. Um, no other questions that I've seen yet, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Hopefully this will work as I um, jump to a different screen. So I'm gonna close out my PowerPoint session and as soon as the lag goes away, I will open the main sphere session. Okay, it looks like we're good. So the um, the meeting sphere session, uh, there's a link that went out in the email, and also if you receive the calendar invitation, you should have it directly. So uh, there's all the information to get into uh, video up at the top, and then uh, meeting sphere information um, down below, and this link should now be active. Got to click a couple times to allow flash, and then I'm at the, uh, the welcome page for the meeting sphere session. So I will go ahead and enter the session and um, provide a quick orientation here. All right, the session is opening up. Um, and so what I'm gonna do, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just quick orientation on uh, how to get around in here. Um, the first thing, which of course I'm not seeing now, is a text size option. We'll get there eventually. Okay, so uh, the, first thing, uh, the first thing you'll see when you log in is you'll see a list of different ecosystems. Um, that we've prioritized across the Eastern Mojave landscape conservation design. Um, there are two, two rows for each ecosystem. Uh, for some of these ecosystems, the potential indicator list was huge, so to make it a little more manageable, we tried to split those up into two categories. So the first category for each of these will be things about ecosystem extent and abiotic factors. Uh, the second is vegetation, fish, and wildlife. Um, one quick note here is that we, um, the categorization um, is not going to matter going into the future. It's just to make it easier to navigate this. So um, if you see something as you go in that you think should be in vegetation instead of ecosystem extent, um, 
don't worry about it that, at this point because it's not going to make uh, not going to make a difference in how we process the results of this. So, um, in order to see the indicators, you click on an item in the list and click join. Okay, and now I see the text option, which is what I was looking for in the beginning, um, and hopefully it's checking. Okay, it looks like folks can still see my my screen. Um, all right, and since I'm back in video here, just a quick uh, specification that Genevieve put um, is that um, Genevieve put the, the link directly into the chat box, um, and it will open in a new window, so it might be difficult to look at both that and what I'm doing. Um, so I should, I'll be able to get through this whole orientation hopefully in like two or three minutes. So if, um, for now, it might actually be helpful if you hang out on the video screen um, and I'll get through it quickly. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to point out is that there's an option in the bottom right for the text size. Um, and there's, uh, which looks like it automatically defaults based on your screen size because earlier it was showing up as regular for me. Um, so if you need uh, larger text to be able to read it, you can click on a different size. Um, or leave it where it is if it shows up by default as regular or small. Um, in my mind, the, the only reason, sometimes it's helpful for the small for some of these lists uh, because it will allow you to see more of the indicators on one screen without having to scroll down. Okay, so um, we'll walk through a couple different options you have in here. Um, again, just looking at the desert, uh, desert scrub and uplands ecosystem. Um, indicator page. The first is you have the option to add an indicator. So to add an indicator, you put it in the chat or in the, the text box down at the bottom where it says enter your idea here, uh, send each item as each idea as a separate item. So if you type in something here, uh, it will show up as an indicator by default in this list above. Um, if you enter a potential indicator, it will be tagged with your name. As you can see, um, Amanda Webb is tagged in all of the current, eco uh, current indicators here so far because she populated this list in advance for us. So if you have indicators for each ecosystem, you can add it directly in that box. Um, the second thing that you can do is identify for you what are high priority indicators, which you'll indicate with these blue sticky dots up on the top, or indicators that you think are irre irrelevant that you can highlight with the red sticky dots up on the top. To use those dots, what you'll do is you click on it. So I'm going to click on the, the red dot and hold. And then you can drag it down to whichever uh, indicator you think is not relevant. So I dropped one on rate of ecosystem change caused by human development. Um, so I indicated that I don't think this uh, indicator is relevant for the Eastern Mojave. Um, you have a total of 10 sticky dots that you can use um, if you want to um, for, um, for irrelevant indicators, that is. If you want to change your mind, you can drag those around uh, to different indicators. You can also pull them back up top if you change your mind and you don't want to say no to any of the indicators. So now I have my 10 red sticky dots again. You also have the option to prioritize indicators for you. So if you have an indicator on this list that you think is super important, you can drag one of your blue dots down to the indicator and select that indicator that's important to you. For now, I'm going to leave it up there. Um, the next functionality of this is that, and I should toggle back, um, Okay, just making sure I'm not missing any, I'll, you know, I'll circle back to questions here in a minute. Um, I'll get through my, my list of discussion points here. Um, the next thing that you can do is comment on indicators that are already in the list. So if you want to do that, you click on the box to the, to the left of the indicator uh, where it's got this um, icon that's supposed to look like a light bulb. Um, and right now, there's zero, zero uh, for this rate of ecosystem change by human development. If you click on that, 
it will take you to a different discussion box where you can enter your comments on that indicator. Uh, we have three different categories that are pre-populated in this. So the first is, do you think this indicator is appropriate? So if you want to comment and say yes, you click on that, um, that item and then enter your comment down below. And then you press the checkbox and your comment will be dropped um, in the appropriate section above. Um, if you want to, if you want to insert uh, comments and questions on this indicator, you click on that line for each indicator. And then finally, um, you know, one thing this uh, partially gets to one of the comments submitted before, but if you are aware of anyone collecting data on a scale that's useful to the LCD, we really want uh, your help identifying where we could potentially use that data um, for the indicator analysis process, and that's the second bullet. Okay, I am not going to make any comments to this indicator, so to exit out of this, I'll click the X and go back. Um, then I'm back to my list of indicators for desert scrub, ecosystem extent, and abiotic. To go back to the overall indicator list, you can click the back arrow on the top left, which will take you all the way out of this, or you can click on the two-way uh, blue arrow in the top center of your screen and select a different indicator there. So if you want to jump to uh, dune ecosystems, which I'm going to pull up and show you that this is a great example in the dune ecosystems where we don't have uh, many indicators. There, we, couldn't, uh, we didn't have any, uh, we didn't have many reference materials to use for the dune ecosystem. So if you have something in there, that's a great example where we could use your help. Okay, um, just so that uh, you know the other functionality in here, the, uh, there are two uh, items on the bottom left of the meeting sphere session. So if you want to see which participants are present, you can click on that. Um, you can see who's on right now. You can also see um, uh, folks that are not on the session right now but have contributed or have been online at any point in the past. So we can actually see um, you know, who we've gotten help with on this. The next feature here is a meeting chat. Um, so next to the list of participants, uh, there's another double bubble <laughs> that you can open and you can um, enter uh, the meeting chat and which I'll do uh, if I can type. Okay, so as Jenny put in there, you can enter questions in there. Um, you can chat uh, with other folks if you want to, you know, talk about the overall, um, you know, issues with meeting sphere. If you have problems with it, anything we can help remedy. Um, this will also be tagged with your name once you're logged in, so you can, um, so that we can follow up with you individually, or that you know, folks know who's in there. Um, and for now, I'm going to close out of this meeting chat. Um, and I, I think I forgot to mention, so um, I know I said if you add an indicator, you will be tagged with your name. And that's primarily so that if we have questions about that indicator, we can follow up with you, um, follow up with you separately. Um, okay, the other piece of this is that that chat box and this session will, be, will remain open um, after this uh, webinar is over, so we'll leave this up. Um, one thing we haven't talked about as a group yet is how long we were going to leave this session, uh, this meeting sphere session open. Um, but we need to have enough time after this to be able to process it for the in-person workshop. So I'm going to propose that we leave it open through uh, Thursday the 15th. Um, but we'll follow up with folks on that. Um, so with that, I will stop talking for a minute um, and regroup to the uh, see if there are any other questions in video. I know we're going back and forth between two applications, um, so I, yeah, I understand if uh, you have any issues with that. Okay. Um, highlight a couple of uh, Genevieve's comments here. Um, which I just scrolled beyond. 
uh, in this, don't worry about making any mistakes. This is just an open uh, brainstorming session, which is what we're using this for. Um, so feel free to just contribute openly. We're not holding anybody to anything, obviously, but again, really, we could use your help in coming up with all, uh, you know, ex expanding this list of indicators, especially. And um, again, especially for folks that won't be able to attend the in-person workshop but want to have um, you know, input on this, feel free to use those sticky dots and that will help us get some of your feedback. Okay, so the um, final thing here is I know we um, put on uh, the invitation that this is going to go until 1230 and we'll stick to that. I will leave the video session open until 1230 as well as um, you know, several of us, I'm sure, will still be on the meeting sphere session um, to answer any uh, questions or comments over there in that chat. I'll have both of those open in each window. Uh, but what I am going to do is officially end the recorded portion of this webinar. Um, and again, I'll leave the video session open as well as the meeting sphere session after this. Um, but I will close out the recording here with a final thank you. So thank you everyone for taking the time to participate in the webinar, especially for those folks that will hang out and help us with the Meeting Sphere session as well. This webinar was recorded and will be made, made available on our YouTube channel, which you can access by searching for Desert LCC YouTube just using a Google search, or you can um, find, you'll be able to find the recording through the desertlcc.org website. The meeting sphere session for submission and prioritization of indicators will be left open for collaboration after this, as I already mentioned. Um, and again, we'll be meeting, we'll be attending the meeting sphere session until 11:30 Pacific time, um, and leaving the video channel open during that period. And with that, uh, again, thank you everyone for your time, and I hope you have a great day. <laughs>